Senator Tim Scott made some comments while he was on the debate stage at the recent GOP primary debate. The comments need to be unpacked, and we're about to do that and go in depth and explain why his comments were so out of pocket, inaccurate, and downright slanderous to black Americans. We're going to fully unpack this, starting with this. When history is invoked in political debates, it's not merely a reflection of the past, but a lens through which we view the present. Recently, Senator Tim Scott made a statement comparing the impacts of welfare to the profound traumas of slavery and subsequent racial violence. He suggested that welfare might have hurt black Americans more than slavery did. Today, we delve deeper into this comparison. We'll explore the historical legacies the nuances and the long-term effects of both slavery and welfare assistance. As we journey through these complex topics, we aim to foster understanding, challenge misconceptions, and illuminate the truths that define the black experience in America. Let's get into it. Let's address some comments that were made by Tim Scott while he was on the debate stage a couple days ago. Here's the challenge, though. Black families survived slavery. We survived poll taxes and literacy tests. We survived discrimination being woven into the laws of our country. What was hard to survive was Johnson's Great Society, where they decided to put money where they decided to take the black father out of the household to get a check in the mail, and you can now measure that in unemployment, in crime, in devastation. If you want to reach... So there goes your Senator Tim Scott, if you're in South Carolina, there goes your guy. Making a case for why slavery... Slavery was uh, less detrimental to the black community than the Great Society, which was uh, a series of policies that were passed under Lyndon B. Johnson. Okay, so what we're going to do is unpack this a little bit. Um, of course, Senator Tim Scott's assertions require a deep dive into historical concerns, context, so we can understand the nature of systemic discrimination and analyze welfare's purposes and its impacts. So here goes my response. So first of all, when we talk about slavery, guys, we need to really understand what we're talking about. And I don't think that Senator Scott is really gonna is really doing a good job or doing it justice. In fact, what he's doing is he's whitewashing slavery. To say, oh man, we, we survived slavery is to is to forget all the people that died during slavery. All the people that died under slavery. All the people that died on the way to slavery. All the people that died trying to escape slavery. And all of the all the repercussions from slavery, he undermines all that and compares it to a government program that he didn't like. And as you can see from the response to the audience and the people there, they liked it. They liked his response. They liked his rebuttal. His his words. They agree with him. They clap for him. In fact, after this segment, after those words were said, some people were arguing if Tim Scott had won the debate. Because Tim Scott did the job of throwing black people under the bus and minimizing slavery and taking all of America off the hook and put it all on Democrats. All of a sudden now, welfare is worse than slavery. Slavery, the brutal institution where millions of Africans were captured, transported, and forced to work in the Americas under inhumane conditions. The legacy of slavery it still permeates in, in American society, even today in terms of economic disparities, racial biases, and systemic racism, something that Tim Scott doesn't admit, admit, admit exists. Because the Tim Scott, the culture of slavery, and then the 100 years of Jim Crow that, assumed, that occurred after it, and now what we go through now, which is post or Jane Crow, which includes mass incarceration, environmental injustice, systemic depression, oppression in various degrees from food to 
hospital, medical care, health care. On another level with Jim Crow Joe. I call it Joe. <laughs> Uncle Joe. Joe Crow. He omits all of that. He admits the physical and mental torture that slaves endured as being slaves. Let's take a moment and really think about what he's saying. He's saying, can you imagine the trauma of having your, your family split up? Hell, can you just not sold on the auction, the auction block only, but also from wherever you were captured from or sold from into the Americas before you got on the boat. Then we got the travel on the boat. I mean, Tim Scott, because I know there have been people I've seen online who are like, well, he's got a point. No, he doesn't have a point. If you think about what slavery was, and I know it, it's painful to think about, but no one asked him to make that comment. He brought this up. So it's my job to rebut it, and what I'm saying is he's not taking into account for one moment the real physical and mental torture that slavery was on black people, on Africans. He didn't talk about, he's not, he's not taking into account the sexual exploitation the breeding, the snatching away of, 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 a, of a mother's offspring, her children, to not being treated as a human being, as being treated as property, like an ox or a goat. He's comparing that. Not only is he comparing it, he's saying it's less, that was less detrimental, that men weren't men and women weren't women. That black men were not considered men and black women were not considered women. They were considered subhuman, three-fifths of a human being. He says that is worse than somebody getting you a check or food stamps. Make that make sense. Sorry. Make that make sense for me. I want to understand it. Because I keep seeing people, I've seen people over the last couple of days say, well, he's got a point. You know, social media is good in some ways and it's horrible in other ways, man. Oh, it's horrible, so horrible in so many ways. People get a they get a platform to show how much they don't know. And they use it for that purpose. Economic deprivation. If you're a slave, you can't acquire wealth. What was it, 245 years? I know they got the 1619 Project. For all those years as a slave, guess what you can't do? Guess what generation after generation after generation after generation after generation? And this is what people need to understand. Not only were you making money for others, you didn't make any money yourself. People left, the people that were alive who had been slaves, whose grandparents had been slaves, whose parents had been slaves, who's, who were formerly slaved, didn't start with anything. They didn't have any money because slave was an economic deprivation. And, and considering America is full of people that wanted to be able to state their own claim in the world, just think what it had to say about them, what that says about them. A country that put people out there in the world without any subsidence who took away their ability. You could work, but you could not benefit from your own work other than not be beat to death. This is what Tim Scott is comparing to pre-K or kindergarten classes because that was part of uh, the Johnson Great Society. He's comparing that. He's comparing welfare to you never being able to, to make money from your work. Denial of rights. Slaves had no rights. They were treated as property and couldn't own a property, get education, or decide any of their own life choices. Yeah, we're going to take our time. We're going to wrap our heads around what Tim Scott's saying. So when I hear you or someone like you or when you hear someone say, but Tim Scott's got a point. I want you to really understand what he's saying. Generational trauma. We talk about the long-lasting effects of slavery have impacted multiple generations, leading to a cycle of disadvantage, poverty, and mental health issues. 
People that were slaves were traumatized. Come on, man. When people get kidnapped, they're traumatized. If you ever been robbed at gunpoint, I was robbed at gunpoint. I didn't go. To, I didn't go see a psychiatrist. Probably should have. It was traumatic. Imagine being robbed at gunpoint every day. Imagine being your family members held at gunpoint. Or people that you loved. Or watching somebody being beat to death. This was what slavery was. Living in a constant air of fear, not knowing what was going to happen to you. And not having any control over it. And those people had kids. So, yeah, it was generational. The poverty, the mental health issues, the traumatic experiences from slavery continue to echo in the lives of descendants of enslaved Africans. And our good friend, Tim Scott's so bad that Dr. Cornel West had to say it. I guess he's my brother. I guess I got to call him, call him my brother, but... So let's move beyond it just a little bit. Let's go to the historical context of post-slavery determination and discrimination. The Black Codes, which existed between 1865 to 1866, these were laws passed by Southern states during Reconstruction that restricted black Americans' freedom. You're free, but you're not really free. Let's now make codes that limit you. Because they said we got to free you, but we can't free. Nah, we... We just playing. You ain't free. Here goes some black codes. It forced them to work in a labor economy based on based on low wages or debt. The decades of racial violence. Remember, Tim Scott says this was bad, but it wasn't that bad. This was bad, but it wasn't that bad. The millions of black people that died during slavery, not, it was bad, but not that bad. The decades following the end of slavery saw an uptick in racial violence, including lynchings against black Americans. Between 19, since emancipation in 1955, there's at least 5,000 lynchings, public lynchings on the books. By white people that just said, hey, let's kill some Negroes. We're talking church bombings. We're talking gang rapes gang murders, attacks. Think the worst things you can think and then imagine no cops to ever come show up to change it. In fact, the cops being in on it. Imagine it being publicized like, hey, we're going to kill a black person today. And everybody in the town coming to a place to watch it happen. And nobody to stop it and no repercussions and nobody goes to jail. Tim Scott says... That's bad, but it's not as bad as you getting free cheese because you're going to get addicted to getting free cheese and you ain't going to want to work hard no more because you love cheese. I mean, it's the words to express the level of disgust I feel for Jim Scott and for his not for him personally, but him taking this position. I don't know him personally. I don't care to know him personally. But to take this position, that black codes, racial violence, Jim Crow era, which is the late 19th century to the 1960s, this was a period marked by strict racial segregation enforced by punitive laws. Punitive laws aimed at black folks up until the 60s. That's why we had a civil rights movement. When people talk about black folks, when they talk about reparations, for instance, they only focus on slavery. They don't even count the period up to the 60s before we really had rights like white people. We didn't have rights. Black people did not have rights in this country equal to white people. Some would say we still don't. But we didn't have actual right rights. The same rights that your grandparents, if you're a white person or Latino person, or a white Latino or Asian person, uh, like the same rights that you were supposed to have, because I don't know how many rights Asians had. I really don't know. 
I don't know. But I know black people didn't have those rights. And Tim Scott is saying, that's bad, but it ain't as bad as getting a free check. Because that check ruined you. The same check that white people got. Remember that. He's not talking about there's a special reparations that black people got. He's talking about black people finally being able to get what white people got. Because white people were getting this money too. In fact, more white people get welfare than black people. And since it was decided by the state, don't you kind of imagine a state See, this is why this is why what Tim Scott said is so repugnant and disgusting. And it angers me so much because I got black people that repeated to say, he got a point. He's not speaking no lies, though. He got he right. White people were getting welfare thanks to FDR. Because people were literally starving to death. So they like the way slaves did when they decided when they just ah, we're not gonna feed you. Or sort of after emancipation, when you didn't have jobs and nowhere to go and no food and no land. Black people starved to death. Well, white people starved to death too. There was no social safety net. When they developed a social, a social safety net, do you think that ascended to black people when black people didn't have rights? So when Tim Scott talks about black people being destroyed and ruined by a system that catered to them or coddled them, which is sort of like a term someone used to that. Black people getting coddled. It's coddling when black people get it. It's not coddling when white people get it, even though white people were getting it since FDR made it possible with the New Deal. Because too many white people were dying. Too many white people were ready to revolt against the country. Will you think the Italians and the Irish and, and the Polish and all these people were, were doing gangster crimes for Where do you think the Godfather came from? Where do you think that old, the whole the little Italy, where, where did all that come from? Poor ass white people that didn't have a safety net. Black people were finally afforded that due to uh, protests. Organizations that were formed that were able to make some headway that included black women to get benefits. Before that, it was it was exclusive to white families. And Tim Scott is saying that ruined us. It didn't ruin white people because, well, it can't ruin white people. And if it did, Tim Scott would never say that because he wants white votes. So he could never say, welfare ruined white people. A lot more white people get welfare but he doesn't care because that, those claps that you heard that he received in the hall there at the GOP debate, he never would have got those claps if he would have said it ruined white people. So what made white people stronger and helped those good white people that work hard because things are just bad. And they're unable to find jobs. Somehow those that same treatment Destroy black people because we need to. If we didn't, if we get something, we we don't deserve it. So that's the welfare and its impact. Welfare programs were created to help those facing economic hardships. Their primary purpose was and still is to provide a safety net for those in need, regardless of race. Disparities in application. While black Americans are often disproportionately represented in the discussions about welfare, the majority of welfare recipients have historically been white. If I know that, if I know, if I know Tim Black, one show, one guy, right? If I'm able to ascertain this data and I can tell you unequivocally, right, flat out, that white, white people get more welfare than black people and have so forever since since America started giving out any type of assistance, white people have received multiple times more of it. You don't think that Tim Scott knows that? (sighs) 
economic mobility. Some argue that welfare can discourage work. However, numerous studies show that most welfare recipients are either already working, actively seeking work, or unable to work due to disability, age, or other valid reasons. So let's take a look at between the two, which is crazy to have to do this, but we got to do it. We got to compare slavery to welfare because Tim Scott stood up there and said it. And though I've seen some people push back about it, they haven't seen a more concise type rebuttal of what Tim Scott said. So here we go. Durability and intensity. Equating the systemic brutality of centuries, centuries of slavery with welfare checks oversimplifies and diminishes the former, or the, the horror, the horror of slavery. He's comparing centuries of slavery to about, I don't know, 50 years of welfare. I don't even want to do this. I really don't want to do this. I mean, Jewish folks, I don't mean to, I don't mean to bring you into this. I don't mean to bring Jewish people into this. Because when I do that, I always get the black Hebrew, black Hebrew Israelites, black Hebrew Israelites going crazy in the comment section. But I got to say this, Jewish folks, you ain't got to say that. All I want you to know is, I, I, I want to speak to this. I want to say, uh, it's always amazing to me that these types of people, these, these sellouts like Tim Scott, they can talk about black people, but they never talk about Jewish folks. Can you imagine what would happen, how quickly Tim Scott would be out of being a senator, if he was to say something about this, about the Holocaust, and compared it to, I don't know, anything. Just imagine if he compared, and hey, Holocaust is bad, but I mean, you know what's worse? Going to the DMV. I don't know if he compared it to anything. We're the only people that they're allowed to do this to. We're the only people that they're allowed to do this to. Agency and choice. Those on welfare today have agency. They can vote. They can get an education. They make life decisions. Slaves had none of these rights or choices. Slaves weren't people. I mean, they were people, but they weren't considered, they weren't treated like people. He said, basically, I know for five generations, black people weren't treated like people, but that's nothing compared to being able to get some food stamps. Getting food stamps is way worse. I'd rather not be treated like a human being. Intent. Welfare programs. Regardless of their flaws, and there are some flaws, don't get me wrong, there are some flaws in welfare programs. Hold on, guys. Did I tell you that there's some flaws in welfare programs? Hey, there are flaws in welfare programs. Absolutely, 100%. There are some flaws in welfare programs because all the conservative type people and some liberals who won't speak up because they don't want the, so, they got social pressure. Because there are liberals who agree with Tim Scott. You don't think there are liberals that agree with Tim Scott? There are some, uh, what they call it, classical liberals. You don't think there's this? There, come on, guys. I, this is the reason why a lot of black folks don't want to ride with white folks on policies for the Democrats. Because they know a lot of those Democrats are just as racist as other people. And they harbor a lot of the same belief systems. Dr. Ajamu, <laughs> Dr. Ajamu, I don't know if Ajamu is a doctor. He's a hell of a philosopher. He would say, Tim Black, we got to meet people where they are and try to, you know, educate them and move on. Welfare programs, regardless of their flaws, are meant to help. They are meant to help. They're not meant to not help. Slavery was an institution built on dehumanization and exploitation. I know what I know what Ron DeSantis in this panel of sellouts said when they said, hey, we got to learn how to do work. Slavery was helpful. 
Some of us use skills we learned on the plantation to go out and get a job. I know that's, I know that's what Tim Scott said. But see, the, if you are able to take something from your bondage, that's because you're industrialist. You know, you're, you're a person that takes something and makes something out of it. You take nothing and make something. Black people have had to do that to survive. But that's not what the intention of the institution was. It was not intending, this was not a job camp, you moron. Slavery was not a summer school. It was slavery. It was exploitation. And when your legs, when your knees went out and your back broke out, you were thrown in a ditch like an old chair that don't work. Do you understand and we got this guy, this senator, on live TV saying that was better than getting a housing voucher. And not only that, we got a whole, whole groups, a whole table of white people afterwards from Fox. Tim Scott did a hell of a job tonight. Yeah, we got Greg Gutfield on The View, on The Five. Boy, that Tim Scott really did a good job. I love what he said there. God, he was so on point. And none of them will lose their jobs. So don't talk to me about cancel culture. Ah, don't do it. Don't even form your mouth to say it. They could throw all my ancestors under the bus and pee on them. And you'll go, good job. Well, they'll go, good job. So what we have here is oversimplification. Before we go to the oversimplification, though, I want to get to this, guys. Now, remember, please, I need you to share this, guys, please. Come on, man. This is important. Because Tim Scott brings up an issue, and I want to address this, man. We got we to gotta look at what Tim Scott's saying, and we got we to gotta rebut it. And not gloss over it. Look, Tim Scott's larger point is that welfare destroys black families because of certain ways that this welfare system was flawed and the ways that it impacted black communities, black families, the black family. I hear it all the time. People say, Tim Black, well, they don't say it to me. They say it on their social media posts. They said that these rules, such as the no man in the house rule, the no man in the house rules split up families and ruined the black community. Black families, black families were torn apart because black men were had to leave the house in order for the black woman to qualify for these benefits. And because of that, they gave an incentive for black folks not to be together. Yada, 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 yada. So the aid to families with dependent children, the FDC, AFDC, was a federal assistance program in the U.S. in effect from 1935 to 1997. It was created by the Social Security Act and administered by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It provided assistance to families, to children whose families had low or no income. It provided financial assistance to children whose families had low or no income. Now, it's true that the, this program, it grew from being a minor, part, a minor part of the Social Security system to a significant system of welfare administered by the states with federal funding. So the states got the money from the Fed, and then they handled the program. Different rules per state. He said it was criticized for offering incentives for women to have children and for providing disincentives for women to join the workforce. Please, once again, remember, far more white women were on this. Far more, far more white families were on this than black families. Do you really think more black, do you really think, let's just talk about the South for a second. Do you really think states 
They made it really hard for black people to vote. States that were very, very Jim Crow. Alabama, Arkansas, for instance, that come to mind. You know, do you think those states really were just throwing money at black people? That's what you think? Is Tim Scott really being honest? So let's go back to this man in the house rule. A number of states enacted the so-called man in the house rule, which disqualified families if there was an adult male, any adult male, present in the household whatsoever. This was part of a broader attempt to discourage welfare dependency by the undeserving, in particular minority families. Where the man didn't have enough work or didn't have work or where the woman had a relationship with men who didn't take care of the family. The man in the house rule was struck down in 68 by the Supreme Court in King v. Smith thereafter. Families with males in the household were eligible for benefits if they were not deemed to be the actual or substitute parents. Although any financial contribution on the part of the male to the family was still considered a part of the family's total income. By 1981, the Supreme Court would further require that states take into consideration the income earned by stepfathers. Did this rule ruin the black family? Points about welfare. There are more white women who were single mothers and are single mothers. More white women and Hispanics are on welfare than black women. And the New Deal was designed for white families in mind. But Tim Scott will never bring up those facts. According to TANF, TANF, the TANF, which is the new system that controls, uh, oversees the, the welfare system, the TANF, TANF, there's about 145 black adults currently getting welfare. Last year that they had on record was 2021. And that's less than 0.5%, less than half a percentage point of black families, black adults, They get it. Less than 1%, a half a percent of black adults currently receive this terrible, 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 terrible government assistance. But white conservatives love hearing it. That was provided by Tim Wise. I didn't know that. Another... Um, Joshua Zates, he made this good comment I want to include it. He says, Tim Scott has essentially come out against Medicare, Medicaid, federal aid to an education, K-12, higher education. The CRA and the VRA, Head Start, uh, SNAP, public television, because that's what the Great Society was. It was all these, all these things. Not just welfare, but Medicare, Medicaid, federal aid that everybody gets, but somehow we are destroyed by it. So this is the point I want to get to, guys. The House, the man in the House rule and all the other complaints that conservatives and some running the mill regular folks have too, not just conservatives. A lot of people feel this way. Let's clear this up. What Scott can't be honest about is why. See, if we start talking about why, if you say, oh, this benefit hurt black people, why? I want people to take a real good look at themselves in their own hearts on this one. Why did black Americans get disproportionately hurt by this, by this, by this, uh, by this benefit. See, to admit, if you're going to say that black people were disproportionately hurt by this benefit, if you're going to be fair, you got to be fair and say there was a reason why. Racism. Yeah, if, if a man can't be in the house because he's not making enough money and, the, and, the, and the, the, the baby mama or the mother or the wife 
the wife, the mother of the children. Hey, baby mama. Okay, that's a horrible term. But you get what I'm saying. If she gets a check and her to qualify for the check, the man had to leave the house. Why would she want to have restrictions and wait on a check unless she needed to check? And why did the man not make enough to take care of that? So here's a couple things that are at play here. Either you believe that black men are somehow psychologically ill-equipped, that there's something cognitively deficient, morally, morally unable, or morally unconscionably able to take care of their children or are reluctant to take care of their wife and their kids, like there's some type of failure, in a, 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 a genetic failure in black men that makes black men not want to take care of their kids, not take care of their families. So either you believe that or you believe that maybe there's something else going on here. Now remember, we had a system that was put in place, not because the government wanted to just give out goodies to the world. It was put in place because there were people dying. There were people so... White people, not people, fuck people. America don't care about people. America cares about white people. Can we can we understand something here? America cares about white people. Something Tim Scott will never admit. So white people were suffering. That's why you do a new deal. You do a new deal because you want to save the country from imploding on itself. And we know, America knows, where there's desperation and poverty it will be crime. Okay? But if white people are going through this, you know black people are going through it. And if we live in a country, if, you, if you're honest enough to say there was Jim Crow, racial discrimination, of course there's job discrimination. If you don't want somebody walking on the same street as you, if you don't want somebody making eye contact with you walking down the street, you damn sure don't want to hire them and give them money. Do you not know that the whole purpose of tipping people at restaurants was because white people did not want to pay, pay black people money, a set wage. So they developed, they developed a system called tipping where instead of you actually getting a job where you got paid a salary, you would get money only if the person that you waited on felt you deserved it. And that's where tipping came from. You want to tell me that a society, they had to come up with a whole other way to pay people who worked because they didn't want to give money to black people. That those black men who could not find work sufficient enough to take care of families, you don't want to believe that that was racial? Because see, Tim Scott would then have to admit that there's a thing called systemic racism, and he don't want to admit that. Tim Scott does not want to admit that there was racial discrimination, systemic racism that impacted black families to the point where black men did not make enough money to take care of their families. So either you believe that or you believe that maybe there's this strange psychosis running through black families where black women are so defective. Yeah, that's it. Black women are so defective that they're only mating with men who don't want jobs. We know to this day that the unemployment rate in the black community is twice that of what the white community is. I wonder what it was, I don't know, in the 60s and 70s. See, the problem is that for black Americans, it's because the discrimination black men received in the workplace made it difficult to make a living. Young black men in the 60s and 70s in the U.S. faced numerous challenges in securing gainful employment that could adequately support a family. Here goes some key, here's some key, key reasons for this. Historical discrimination. Yeah, Tim Scott, black men were historically discriminated against. The long legacy of racial segregation and discrimination meant that black men often did not have access to the same education or job training opportunities as white men. Redlining and housing discrimination. Discriminatory lending practices like redlining kept black families 
in urban areas with lower property values, fewer resources, making it harder for black men to find nearby job opportunities. Employment discrimination. Even after the Civil Rights Act of 64, which prohibited employment discrimination on the basis of race, such discrimination persisted but both overtly and covertly. Hiring practices, promotions, job placements were often racially biased. Guess what? That still happens today, but see, if you're Tim Scott, you will never admit that. Deindustrialization. The 60s and 70s saw a significant decline in manufacturing jobs in many urban areas, a sector where many black men were employed. These jobs moved to suburbs or overseas. These jobs moved to the suburbs and overseas. So if you can't get a job, well, if you, if you live in the inner city and the jobs are in the suburbs, and they don't hire Negroes, what do you do? And you can't get a bank loan to start a job of your own, to start a business. What do you do? Oh, come on, Tim. This is a victim mentality. Man, I'm giving you facts and figures. I'm telling you what it is. Racial stereotyping. Employees sometimes held and acted upon racial stereotypes. Guess what? They still do. Viewers act on it too. Such as, <laughs> such as the belief that black men were lazy or unreliable, even if those notions were baseless. Yeah, black people were lazy and shiftless the moment they stopped being slaves. Yeah, because it's crazy. Criminal justice system. Disproportionate policing and arrest in black communities sometimes made it harder for black men to secure jobs, especially if they had a record. Lack of networking opportunities. White men often have better connections and networking opportunities due to historical advantages in education and employment. It made it easier for them to learn about the, to learn about and secure better paying jobs. You know that commercial? Weren't you guys get a new house? God, I didn't even know there were new houses there. That's how the jobs be. How'd you get a job there? I didn't even know they were hiring. Educational barriers. Schools in predominantly black neighborhoods often lacked resources. Guess what? They still do. One of the most segregated cities in the U.S. is Chicago. That's for that black guy who was like telling me, we need to stop calling Chicago. So the schools lack resources. They suffer from overcrowding. It had outdated materials, making it more challenging for students to acquire the skills necessary for higher paying jobs. Here goes a big one for all my class friends who all say, man, if Dr. Cornell West would only focus on class issues. First of all, black people are 90% 90, 90 of black workers, 90% of black male workers, I don't know about women, is working class. Or working class, meaning non-degree having jobs. That's what I mean by working class. Union discrimination. Yeah, class folks, because the unions discriminated too. I know it's crazy, right? We're all in this together with our class struggle. See this? See this? Tip Scott is a black man and acts like he don't see color either. I thought only white folks got away with that. <laughs> Unions have been instrumental in improving working conditions and wages for many. Black workers often face discrimination within those very same unions. Which limits their job opportunities and advancement. Spatial mismatch. Tim, what the hell is spatial mismatch? Jobs, particularly jobs that were paying high, that, that are higher paying, moved to the suburbs in these decades 
while many black individuals remain in urban centers, this geographical separation from job opportunities made employment harder to secure. Basically, you didn't live near the job. How many times have you been offered a job or heard about a job and you had public transportation, you couldn't get to it? That's on purpose. I know. To this day. Economic downturns. Economic recessions such as in the mid-90s, I'm sorry, in the mid-70s, can exasperate racial employment disparities. One more time. Economic recessions such as in the mid-70s, can exasperate racial employment disparities hitting communities already at economic disadvantage harder. So things are already bad, but then we got downturns like recessions that make things even worse, or, you know, like lockdowns. That's one of the points people can say, oh, the lockdowns ruined businesses. We were barely making it before that. What about all the time we were discriminated against and all the hurdles that black businesses face Besides the lockdown, what about that whole thing, you know, being black that entire time? What about that? No words. That's divisive. But only when we talk about something in common we have, which is lockdowns due to the jab. The pandemic lockdowns. That's the only time they want to have a conversation. And they don't want to really have it then. They're just saying it then or now because they got to prove a point. So they'll use our struggle and our pain to say, hey, we're in the same boat. Remember that COVID lockdown really hurt us. But black, but black businesses operated a handicap clip. Put it this way. Black businesses on a normal day operated at a deficit less than white businesses were getting during the lockdown. Yeah, if you say white businesses were hobbling with a bad leg during the lockdown, that's how black businesses run when we're open for business without a lockdown. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you weren't talking about it, nor had any interest in us in those conversations before the lockdown. That's why I call BS. BS on your fake talking points. BS on this whole we in this together thing. But that's a whole nother story. It's important enough that even though these factors exist, somehow black people find a way to rise above it. But those aren't the people that Tim Scott wants to talk about. And when he does talk about them, he uses them as a bludgeon against the people that didn't, were not able to rise above it. Yeah, any successful black people, he uses as an example to point fingers at the others and say, look what you could have did. Instead of saying, look at the system. The system should have made it for all y'all to be able to make it. He don't do that. He look at the few people that make it or the smaller number of black people that were able to be successful in spite of and then uses them as an example to blame and demonize those that don't. Because that's what Tim Scott does. So anyway, Tim Scott oversimplifies. It compares two things that don't go together or two things that are totally dissimilar. Slavery and a welfare check ain't the same thing. It's insulting as hell that people would even entertain it as being an accurate statement. But the Republicans have for a very long time want to absolve America from slavery. And it will use it. And so it's only really said, I've only really heard it said by Republicans who want to blame Democrats. It's the most disingenuous thing in the world. You want to blame Democrats because they had Democrats. I hate Democrats. They're fighting against Democrats. And I get it. You fight against the Democrats. Why you got to use black people in order to try to score points? Yeah, see what the Democrats did to black people? See what they did? Was it for black families being split up because of welfare? What about that 300 years of slavery? Oh, that's nothing. Let's ignore that. There you go, bringing up old stuff. 
What's that got to do with you? I don't know. Did your parents leave you anything? Did your parents pass down any wealth? Did your grandparents do anything with their lives? Did they just exist and die and leave nothing behind? Yeah, that's important. It's called legacy. So that people have stuff. They're not making any new land, dummy. So anyway. So Tim Scott's Tim Scott's comments. They're more than just wrong. Way past wrong. Wrong is, hey guys, it's 8.53. Now it's 9.53 on the East Coast. Now it's 8.53. Now look, oh, it's really 8.53. If you said it was 9.53 on the East Coast, you'd be wrong. That's wrong. That's called a mistake. That could be called a mistake. But what Tim Scott said wasn't a mistake. He was placating his conservative base because he's at 2%. And the only way he could see himself getting to 3 or 4 or maybe 5 if he's really lucky is if he throws all black people under the bus. And time and time again, what does a black politician do? He throws black people under the bus. He goes to his bag of... How can I dump on black people and elevate myself? How can I use what I have? Oh, I know what I got. My blackness. Let me use my blackness to help me get myself over. Yeah, Tim Scott wants to point out and make it an issue that black people were getting welfare checks. No, we receive less welfare checks than white people. And Lord knows America did not come up with a welfare system to help black people. That's just stupid to even imagine. Because that ain't how America's ever functioned. This is a country to set us free with nothing. And then put us back in jail to work for free all over again. With black codes and mass incarceration. And Tip Scott wants us to believe that a bunch of Democrats said, hey, let's give them checks. So anyway, Tip Scott, Tip Scott, that very same guy is using his blackness, his skin color, an actual way to prop himself up to get a check too. And a badge or a seat as a Republican senator. That's right. Tip Scott uses his color to get a seat as a Republican senator by selling out his color, his race, his ancestors, his lineage, in order to secure that slot. Because the only thing that Tim Scott has to offer is he's willing to throw black people under the bus and be the face of the GOP and nod and grin and skin and grin on every racist policy, every horrible action. And don't get it twisted. I spend most of my time going at Democrats because they deserve it. And I probably probably will go on forward, spend a lot more time on Democrats. But you know what didn't happen last week? Democrats did not get on the debate stage in front of the whole world and tell the world that black people, they were okay being raped, murdered, sold, tortured. They're getting money from a system that was giving out money to everybody who were in a certain situation. As if white women were given the same amount of money. The problem is, similar to what we have in COVID, if there is a problem, people that could get a welfare check who are unable to get a job at a livable wage, now look at that job that doesn't pay and they go what the hell is this that's because people are underpaid but those are two totally different things in a different total conversation than comparing it with slavery if you want to have a conversation about welfare reform or food stamps or benefits or snap benefits any of that stuff why does that have to include black people and why does it have to be focused on why does it have to be compared to slavery and this is a horrific thing to do. It's horrible. And what's only more disgusting about it is that there are black people who are uninformed enough. Uninformed enough. 
and loud enough to agree with it. And I can only hope that they're just wrong and not sellouts. There are a lot of other words I could use for them, but that's as far as I want to go tonight. <clears throat> that's as far as I want to go tonight. So anyway, that's all I got on this. Chip Scott, <clears throat> you at 2%. You deserve to be at 1%. You're a disgrace. You'll never see this. But I want the sentiments that I express in this video to go somehow, somehow find you in the ether. Let you know just how horrible a brother you are, man. And another thing, guys, when uh, when you posing with celebrities, and celebrities that pose with Tim Scott, and yuck it, yuck it up, and key, key, key with Tim Scott, so they think all of this is a game to them. Politics is a game, and, and disrespecting black people is a game. Everything is a game to them. They take nothing serious. Black people, we gotta hold them responsible. We gotta hold them, we gotta hold them accountable for their actions. Hold hold Tim Scott accountable for his actions. Make, make Jasmine, Representative Jasmine Crockett responsible for her actions. We don't need all that extra. That's really all I got, guys. My name is Tim Black. You know what to do. This is the uh, this is a Tim Black Black Table. We do this every Sunday at 7 p.m. ish. Hope that you got something out of this. I hope that this was informative. I hope that it was robust. Took my time. I want to get to everything. Tim Black just delivered not only a blistering smackdown to Senator Tim Scott, he deepened the conversation on the history of black Americans and shut down the Republican talking points on slavery was little more than some form of an apprenticeship program for Africans entering the new world. The lies must end now. If you found this segment valuable, support black independent media by subscribing now and click the recommended video on the left and watch another video. We love you, we love us, and we will never stop standing up for what we believe. For the TBTV Network, I'm Alicia Iverson. It's a new day.